Oh, I can do the what do you need for the Oh, well, uh, just for the presentation. Oh, it's just tough. Yeah, just oh, okay. And I'll, I can turn the track lights on so that they can get some spotlight over our bags. Oh, that's a good one. 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 Oh, so, so I was thinking, right, you can't get that. Yeah, so hopefully, you can get that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. so. I think so. Yeah, I'll leave you down right now, and then when you're on the other side, we'll just start right off. That's fine. I got up, I went over there, I sat down. I don't like going. I don't want to fall asleep. Is that about a life right there? We can see the screen really well. You can see the screen really well. I've been on this right now. What are you going to do to be nice? Is this the time? Is there a thing that you can do? That time is very slow. That's okay. It's about life to keep people falling asleep. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.
You mean with the general public? Yeah. Well, being in some kind of formalized training, I mean, that would that take us an hour? Hour to you? I think it's very good. Yeah. 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 And actually, I think if you did a, a, a formal inter program and wove it into that, you could do it too. I think it'd be really cool yeah. to get here to present, like somehow, you know, do it maybe a little bit different with the evidence, um, but kind of give different, split your audience up in a few groups and give them different evidence and then let them debate it and let them kind of talk about it and then have that discussion at the end. I don't know. Okay, cool. Well, I just might do that. So, so I have a question for you. What's your take on Pluto? <laughs> <laughs> I do not believe Pluto is a planet. Oh. Um, it's very saddening to me. Uh, you know, from the culture of it, but it's also very exciting to see science at work, and I love that. I love that you can still you know, see things change and discover new things. And so when when they and actually, you know, it was I was working at Bryce at the time and doing a lot of astronomy programs, and so I had a lot of visitors asking that question. And my gut reaction at first was like, no, Pluto is a planet. But then as I started talking to visitors about it. Um, if that was what solidified it in my mind. This is really exciting, and I am happy Pluto is no longer a planet. So, um, anyway, sorry. <laughs> but now I don't want to take any more time away from Patrick. Um, so to delve into climate science and how climate change is impacting our parks, there's no better person than the National Park Service climate change scientist uh, to talk about that. So we're fortunate today to have um, Dr. Patrick Gonzalez um, join us. And I just want to also preface this by when we've done these types of trainings in the past, so we mentioned a little bit yesterday about the Earth to Sky program that's done a couple of climate change trainings for interpreters. Um, you know, we've relied on scientists from outside organizations. That program has relied mostly on NASA climate scientists. And you know, NASA has a very different mission than the Park Service. And you know, it's, so it's, it's just tailored differently. And so the fact that we now have our own climate scientists in the Park Service is very cool. So it's it's just really a privilege to have Patrick join us today. And um, I just want to tell you a little bit about Patrick. Um, he's a, a forest ecologist, and he's conducted field research in Africa, Latin America, and the United States. Um, his published work has examined ecological impacts of climate change, adaptation of natural resource management, and forest carbon solutions. And I don't know if you'll talk maybe a little bit about some of those things today. Um, and he's previously worked at the University of California in Berkeley. Um, and he is also a lead author for some of the IPCC reports. Um, and as part of Patrick's um, commitment to living a, a carbon-free lifestyle, he does not have to so he started walking yesterday. <laughs> no, we did. We did actually get him at the party from here. But he, you know, he walks to work. He lives um, close enough to downtown DC that he can that he can use um, a lot of the public transportation. And I know he does a number of other things to reduce his carbon footprint. So um, we are just very happy to, to have you here. And I'll turn it over to Pat. Thank you, Randy. And good morning to everybody. Good morning. Good morning. A dead tree in Africa was the first sign that I saw of climate change in the field. It was 18 years ago, and I was in Senegal in West Africa, which is just south, an area just south of the uh, Sahara Desert. And I was at the foot of a Prosopis juliflora tree, I'm sorry, a Prosopis africana tree, which the wolf call a year, and it was dead. And it should otherwise have been very healthy. There was no signs that uh, people had cut it or no signs of disease or damage. But a year of field work and tree cores and analyses of climate data and population, human population data, and I, I discovered that actually climate change had caused such a severe drought that it caused the die off of, of that tree and trees across Senegal and across the Sahel. And 10 years later, I saw another huge sign of climate change when I stood 100 meters above the floor of um, the 
Tasman Glacier in Araki, Mount Cook National Park in New Zealand. And I was at a point where you could see the you could see the scraping of the glacier on the side, and 100 meters below was the the, the present day level of the glacier because analyses there by New Zealand scientists have shown that climate change has actually melted that glacier over 100 meters. That's over 30 story t stories tall. But we don't need to go to Senegal or New Zealand to see the impacts of climate change because um, uh, we are seeing the impacts of climate change in the national park system now. And for example, in Yosemite National Park, Field, published field research has shown that vegetation is shifting upslope and small mammals are sh shifting upslope. And that climate change and not other local human uh, factors are the cause. So uh, today I, I will uh, speak to you about climate change science, about impacts in national parks, and about what uh, uh, National Park Service Climate Change Science is doing to take action to help resource managers confront this challenge. And the fundamental challenge, I have a hard time with it. Hey, Elise. Okay. Is it too far? Uh, maybe. Yeah, you're, prob you're probably a little bit too far. Do you want me to? Okay. I can speak no, no, no. Right can um, stand over here if that's close enough. Yeah, that is. Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, you know what? I'm glad I'm not the only one back here. Oh, you know what? <laughs> See, it's for a left handed. The left button is for. Oh. <laughs> can you go backwards? No, no, it's, it is the thing. Okay. Anyway. So goes my smooth transition. <laughs> the, 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 the fundamental challenge then to the National Park Service is that our mission of managing resources for multiple benefits for future generations is tied to fixed places. But climate change is shifting climate and shifting ecological zones and shifting other factors. Um, and and so the conditions are shifting, but the, the places are fixed. So today, um, again, we'll go through four sections here. And Angie thought it would be a good idea to break it into actually uh, two uh, parts, uh, main parts. And one is the physical science, the basic uh, uh, science of climate change. And I, understand, and I know that you've uh, been reading documents. Some of you have participated in uh, scenario planning, a, a lot of you have, have, have uh, uh, some basic knowledge of climate change science. I'm going to start from the beginning. We're going to do that for about 15 minutes and then take 15 minutes of questions just on the physical science of climate change. And then um, speak about historical impacts and then that's the past and then future vulnerabilities and then end up with uh, what the Park Service is doing about some of this. So, in the climate literacy book, they went through peer review, and, and, and all of you in your careers have probably uh, uh, seen this also. Just wanted to make the point that in this presentation, all of the examples I give will be from published peer reviewed scientific uh, uh, literature, including the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is a group of uh, about 2,000 of us who periodically uh, compile and assess the, the published scientific literature and publish the definitive global assessments of climate change and forest carbon. And so this is from the 2007 report. And of course, um, boy, this really isn't the... <laughs> <coughs> Do you want to use the keyboard instead? Yeah, this is the keyboard. Um, yeah, the keyboard is well. Oh, cool. Yeah. Easy. <laughs> okay, let's. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Patrick, this proves you're smarter than me because I've been using the mouse. Okay, 
and what I was going to say was, of course, the main form of uh, published scientific research comes in the form of articles in, uh, in specialized scientific journals uh, like this, uh, Global Ecology and Biogeography. Okay, so the greenhouse effect starts with solar radiation from the sun. It comes down in the form of ultraviolet waves into the earth. Uh, some of it is reflected, and some of it is absorbed. This is actually a very dewy And some of it is uh, some of it is reflected, and some of it is absorbed by the earth. And then the energy that's absorbed by the earth is re-radiated from the earth in a different form as infrared radiation which is another word for heat. And so some of that heat now, these red arrows, so the yellow arrows are ultraviolet radiation, it goes into the earth, the red arrows are heat. Some of it goes right through the atmosphere um, where there's nothing to block it, but some of it encounters greenhouse gases, which includes carbon dioxide, methane, and a number of other constituents which reflect the infrared radiation back down to the Earth. And so that is the basic mechanism that warms the Earth and is causing the changes that we've been seeing since the end of the Industrial Revolution. So you see here, we actually only have three ways of warming the Earth. One is, the sun somehow puts out more energy. The second is, if we have more greenhouse gases that trap the uh, heat in, into the earth. And the third way is if somehow something was in the, in the it, it, energy was escaping from the, the center of the earth up to the surface. Okay. So what I'm gonna show you now then is the evolution of greenhouse gases for over 650,000 years. And on this bottom scale is the time, and zero is um, today, or I'm sorry, zero is uh, 1 AD, and then it goes back in time, 700,000 years, and it goes, uh, and this goes forward in time. And on that axis is the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in parts per million. And it goes from zero to 400 on this graph. And so, over time, carbon dioxide has gone up and down in the atmosphere, and that's due to orbital cycles, the distance from the Earth to the Sun, the tilt of the Earth, and the, the angle of that tilt. And so, uh, because of that, uh, vegetation grows in different periods, it absorbs carbon dioxide, and it other uh, periods, the vegetation dies, releases carbon dioxide. We have <coughs> ice ages and we have warm periods. And that's reflected uh, here. We have the cyclical pattern up to 1777. This data goes up through 1777. Now, uh, that's when the Industrial Revolution started. We had more coal burning, more uh, fossil fuel burning for human activities. And you see in the space of uh, 200 years, carbon dioxide shot way up. And it shot way up outside of the range of natural variability. And actually, subsequent to when I made this graph, um, uh, other scientists have extended the uh, time period back uh, to 800,000 years. And we see that the uh, level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today is greater than any time in the past 800,000 years, and it's well beyond the range of natural variability. And if we continue uh, our motor vehicle use, power plants, deforestation, along the same lines that we are right now, carbon dioxide could even uh, go further and off the graph. So um, here's the carbon budget then for 2008, and motor vehicles, power plants, cement plants, 
emitted about 9 million tons of deforestation, mainly in the tropical rainforests, and in about 1, 1 billion tons. So that plus means uh, a release of carbon to the atmosphere. And if you add those up, it's about 10 billion tons going up into the atmosphere. Now, vegetation through photosynthesis naturally removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And also soil biota uh, removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Plankton in the ocean and ocean water itself removes <coughs> carbon dioxide naturally from the atmosphere. But you see that the natural capacity here is only about um, is only about six to seven billion tons. So remaining accumulates in the atmosphere up to four billion tons. And so this is the fundamental imbalance that is causing climate change. That plus uh, four billion tons. Now the chemical constituents of actual carbon and the other gases in the atmosphere <coughs> show us that the greenhouse gases are from human activities and they're not from volcanoes or geysers they're not from other natural sources so um, <coughs> we actually have three different uh, uh, chemical ratios that we can look at and see that the, the actual increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is from human activities and not from natural sources The major impact of this, of course, has been an increase in global surface temperature. And this, the top graph, is uh, about 1,800 years of actual temperature measurements plus reconstructions of temperatures from tree rings, from boreholes, from ice cores. And this bottom uh, graph is just an expansion of the, of the last millennium. And of course, on the, on the side there is the temperature itself. And the zero point is the, um, is the 1850 to 2005 average. So it's just comparing it to the, uh, uh, that industrial average. And we see here that, um, we see here that temperature has increased to its warmest levels in 1,300 to 1,700 years. Now looking at the sun that reaches the top, the, the, the solar energy that reaches the top of the atmosphere using the satellites from NASA, uh, we actually see that the sunlight reaching the top of the atmosphere, which is this red graph here, cycles up and down according to sunspot cycles. And at the same time, surface temperature has been increasing. So solar changes are not causing the, the temperature increases. Another piece of evidence uh, looks at the difference between what uh, actual temperatures are um, and then modeling with physics what temperatures should be given all of the changes in, in greenhouse gases. And then looking at um, what the temperature changes would be with only natural causes. So the black lines are uh, temperatures over, uh, over time from observations. The blue bands are what the temperatures would be if only natural like causes like geysers and, and volcanoes and the sun were call, uh, causing it. And the pink are natural causes plus all of our emissions from cars and power plants. And you see that the pink bands, they track, they track the uh, black lines for all the continents of the world, for, the, for global uh, land, for global ocean, and for the world as a whole. <clears throat> so what this indicates is that human, ex human emissions explain the temperature increases and not just natural forcings. So that combination of lines of evidence carbon dioxide is way above natural variability for 800,000 years. The chemical constituents of the carbon dioxide show traces of human activity. Um, modeling shows that, <clears throat> that uh, human activity explains temperature better than just natural causes. 
combining all that, we can quantify then the human activities and the natural processes. And what this graph shows on, on this axis is basically an increase in heat at the surface or a decrease in heat at the surface. And zero means no change in heat at the surface. So of course red is hotter and blue is, is cooler. And it's just a bar graph. On the side you have all the different factors that could cause heating or cooling. And, uh, and we uh, scientists have, have looked at all of the different factors. And we see here uh, natural processes are very small. And human activities then account for 93% of the observed warming of the Earth. So human activities account for 93% of the observed warming of the Earth. So in conclusion, on this first part, on the physical science then, we've achieved the scientific consensus on the causes of climate change. Um, and here are quotes from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's last report from 2007. Warming of the climate system is uh, unequivocal and is due to anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, so there you go. That's the basics of uh, the, the, the physics of uh, climate change and what's causing it. So now we can uh, take questions for about 15 minutes and then we'll move into the, the other part. <laughs> Nice job putting that. <laughs> I loved it. Oh, okay. thanks. That was so nice and succinct and, and easy to follow. And we definitely want to capture something like that oh, for, nice. for our curriculum, for our course. Oh, great. I'm giving uh, Angie the PDF file of this so you can use it as a reference. But it's the slides without what you said, though, wouldn't be, wouldn't be as effective. Because you, you summed it up really nice and cleanly. Oh, thank you. Uh, I wish I were writing, writing it down what I said. <laughs> I can remember it. But uh, I, I've actually given it. Uh, we may have recorded it. So. Yep. Pardon? We might have recorded it. So. Oh, really? You have? We're recording everything. Yeah. Oh, wow. Cool. So. It would be great to get the wave file. Over there. Yes? I, I had a question about the one uh, slide you showed where it had uh, you know, the, the budget of 4 billion tons or whatever extra yeah. or so. The, the question I had is, let's see. Yep. I'll go back. Go ahead. I'll find it. Okay. Um, was just, so humans, actually I kind of need to see it in order to. Uh, oh, okay. Okay, so um, motor vehicles, power plants, deforestation, uh, together we're added up to just about 10 billion. Um, whereas naturally, as you pointed out, the earth six to seven would be removing. Yeah. So. In the event of no humans, would we would carbon dioxide be decreasing right now? Since vegetation and soil and oceans are all removing all this, but we humans aren't putting that ten billion into the atmosphere. Um, in the absence of human activities, it would follow that long graph. So again, and currently, um, uh, currently we're we would have been in a slight cooling period. We would have been in a slight, you know, I mean, without, without human activities. So I would say, is this, so can we say that carbon dioxide without humans would be decreasing in the atmosphere right now? Is that what this is right showing? Now. Right now. It would be, it was somewhat cyclical then. But would it be in balance with the other thing With vegetation, uh, uh, I know what you're asking, and I'm trying to think of a scientific reference that I, you could actually say uh -huh. that um, that carbon dioxide would be decreasing in the absence of human activity. And I don't think you can say that it's, okay. it's it might be in balance, and it might be slightly decreasing. I don't. Uh, I can look that up. I don't think we need to make that argument. No, I was but, just. Um, but uh, <clears throat> but but it might actually be mainly in balance, but. You know, given the, geo the geological cycles, we kind of expected it, expect it to be slightly decreasing now. Yeah. Um, why is deforestation putting carbon in the atmosphere? Is that because there's no sink for the carbon to go into? 
Okay, well, the sink is actually in the negative 4.7. So that's gross deforestation, and that's gross, um, you know, that's, that's gross vegetation. So if you subtract it, um, you know, 4.7 minus 1.2. So there's a yeah, force on a net sink. Mm -hmm. So um, for tropical deforestation, we're releasing some at the same time the forests that remain are, are sequestering uh, some. Why is cutting the tree releasing carbon? Just, uh, yeah. Okay, the um, forests actually represent a store of carbon that used to be in the atmosphere. So in photosynthesis, um, uh, plants convert the carbon in uh, gaseous carbon dioxide into biomass. When you when you uh, cut anything down, or even throw out <coughs> stuff in the compost pile, mm -hmm. it, the uh, process of respiration it breaks down into carbon and water eventually. So, um, so that's a, did I answer your question? I think so. It's okay. okay. It's, it's a kind of decomposition of process yeah. rather than combustion. It's both actually. Um, burning releases the carbon dioxide immediately. It actually also releases nitrogen oxide and other things and particulates. But it releases the carbon dioxide immediately. But when a log falls in the forest, it will take you know, a long time for, for that. So the cellulose will fix the carbon for a long time. And over time, it, it, through respiration, through oxidation, you know, it releases it. So that's mostly deforestation by burning. Uh, it's both burning and mechanical clearing. So, yes, I read some time ago that the global warming is causing the permafrost to um, melt, and the melting permafrost is then decomposing, and that actual decomposition is releasing massive amounts of carbon dioxide, and I don't see that in this budget? Uh, currently, it is, it is not um, uh, as much as deforestation, but it has the potential for actually exceeding uh, deforestation. Um, it's starting off slowly now, and the fear is, is that, uh, I shouldn't say the fear, the concern is that, <coughs> that we'll, we will reach a point, uh, a threshold point, <coughs> Uh, where um, you'll have uh, massive uh, permafrost melting that yeah. releases the, the, the carbon in the peak. But right now, the, the uh, magnitude of that is much less than uh, deforestation. Well, maybe that maybe it was the, the, the reporter that was reporting on it. Maybe you misunderstood what the scientists were saying because the way it was written, it sounded to me like they had already reached that point where it was the decomposition was releasing more carbon dioxide. It actually got to the point where it was releasing so much carbon dioxide that it was going to be hard to... It's, po it's, it's possible that in local areas, and I know actually that University of Alaska Fairbanks researchers have, have shown that in local areas, um, uh, the release is fairly substantial, but you know, globally, the global total is still is not as great as tropical deforestation. However, it has the potential. It's potential. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I, I would say the, the reporter was was probably right that you know, you know, per unit area for that small area, the, the emission probably is uh, substantial. Uh, okay. You. Um, I got two real quick questions. Um, can you talk a little bit about? Um, you said it's, it's the warmest temperatures in 1300 years. Can you explain a little bit what was happening around 700 AD and how that does or does not relate to the carbon cycle? Uh, industrial revolutions in 1750 has made that rise up. But yes. 1300 years ago surprised me. I thought we were the hottest we've been for many thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Oh, that's what you're asking. Uh, well, the, the, the issue is that to reliably reconstruct, we can only reliably reconstruct temperatures back this far. It doesn't mean that. It, 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 it's possible that the temperatures are the highest in many 
hundreds of thousands of years, but we can only reliably with tree cores and with ice cores and with boreholes um, reconstruct back to, to that point. So just scientifically, we don't have the confidence that we would say uh, that's a lot of Just a yeah. fairly it, this is going to sound really simple, and I don't want no, to insult anybody. There, no, absolutely. That's why I'm not here to go through the, the fundamentals. Not a problem. Well, since uh, here's here's somebody saying this to me. Since uh, well, volcanoes. If there's a lot of volcanic activity, it tends to cool the earth. Why is that? When volcanoes also produce CO2. I think I know the answer, but I just want to hear. Oh, that. okay. Uh, because volcanoes, uh, most of the emissions <coughs> are in the form of particulates which uh, reflect uh, sun before it gets to the earth. And so, um, and that's actually that's very good. simple. We've yeah, seen a, a, saw a very substantial effect of Mount Pinatubo in 1991 in the Philippines as a, uh, one of the biggest uh, volcanic eruptions in the past uh, few decades. And saw a, a, a dip in global temperatures for, for uh, several years because of that particulates in the atmosphere. Yes, Larry. Dr. Gonzalez, let me, uh, let me just echo Becky. This is perhaps one of the best presentations I've yet seen. It's so simple, concise. Kudos to you for putting it together. Oh, thank you. The question I have is, given, given the very compelling lines of evidence that we've got, why, does, why do we have the IPC language as such that it is still very likely that this is resulting from anthropogenic causes? What is perhaps the origin still of that uncertainty? And do you think that in, in future reports by the FECC that that language is likely to remain with change? <coughs> the, the IPCC recognizes <coughs> the sensitivity of the, the issue uh, to policymakers and to the general public, and so um, has erred on the side of uh, being, uh, erred on the side of caution with the terminology. Um, the 2007 report used the word unequivocal and um, likely, which means 90% 90, 90 confidence. <coughs> so that's more than had ever, had ever been said previously. And the 2013 report, I'm sure, will, will actually have a, a much stronger statement. So, yeah, thanks. I like the percentage, though. I mean, that, yeah. That, that quantification of it is something that people can wrap their heads around. Oh, first I kind of didn't want to get into well, that. But versus <coughs> versus the, the subjectivity of the word likely or oh. unequivocal. And how non-scientists think of the word likely is like, right. oh, it's likely. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. 93%, 93 oh, that's funny. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, um, that's great. No, that's, 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 a, that's a great point. And um, I can actually show you. IPCC has defined uh, the terms. Uh, uh, Angie has seen this because I've shown it in the, I'll make you have it, but I've shown it in, in the scenario plan because it's actually something that I use in the scenario plan. Um, the, the different words have very precise uh, scientific levels. Uh, and so extremely likely is 95%. And virtually certain is 99%. But likely is uh, okay. I think likely is uh, like 90 percent, but um, the public doesn't get that distinction. Yeah, I know. Uh, that's a, that's a really good point. That's a very uh, interesting. And I don't think the it's interesting because I don't think the scientific community has ever really tried to explain that yeah. to the public. And and when when uh, Joe Public will read that it's likely or even extremely likely or even the 99 percent one, which is Virtually certain. Virtually certain. Which actually is still a, that <laughs> element of uncertainty in there. Yeah. Now they're yeah. still guessing, you know. And and that that goes into the the culture of science. Of, um, you know, they're you know very good scientists thought you know Pluto was a big planet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. There, there are things that like completely upend mm. that Einstein's. Theory of relativity completely upended Newton's uh, theory of mechanics, um, and nobody had thought of it before. And and so, like Newton, we could have said, uh, we could have said in uh, the late 1800s that we were, you know, uh, 
that, that, that Newtonian mechanics so it's very, it was, it was, ex, it was very likely, it was extremely likely to be true. But actually we know that it doesn't hold for, for long time scales and that, and that uh, Einstein's theory is well. Anyway, so, so, that so that's why it's, that. it's kind of in the culture of science like holding out, well maybe there's something we never thought of that somebody else, um, but you know, for, you know, that's kind of cosmic, but you know, getting back to climate change, it's, it, you know, it, it, it's a little more uh, concrete. Uh, and the issue here was recognizing that important decisions are made based on what uh, might be success. So just bearing on the side of caution. Yeah? Do, do I remember correctly that one had... And then afterwards. Okay. Oh, were you pointing? No, 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 I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Um, that in the 2007 IPCC report, wasn't the language in the draft originally more certain and there was pressure from the US and China to lower it from very likely to likely? Am I remembering this correctly? Or did I actually like cannot remember, it but it, it, it brings up a point that the IPCC is the United Nations body and uh, by, its own, uh, by its own rules, you can take a vote on decisions but by UN, <coughs> by UN custom, uh, decisions are taken by consensus. That means 192 parties agree to it. And so um, after the scientists, after we present these huge reports, um, the, uh, the delegates from the different ministries of foreign affairs in our Department of State actually get together and they go word by word through a short summary. And it's in that process of agreeing to every single word in the short summary that some diplomatic um, negotiation takes place on wording, but it doesn't affect the underlying uh, signs. Um, it's basically, it's a summary, it's called a summary for policymakers. Um, so, yeah. Um, when, when thinking about the science and thinking about take home messages that we would want, <clears throat> want our audience to, to grasp, would you say that it's more scientifically accurate to stress the importance that, <clears throat> it's, uh, that it's out of balance or that the rate of change is different? Oh. That, that it's historically out of, the flux of greenhouse gases is out of balance, that balance issue, or is it that the rate of change is the concern? <laughs> Both. Both. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I was just reflecting on your, your question. To, um, mm -hmm. Both. I mean, I, uh, it's, it's a matter of emphasis. And I guess maybe you've picked up that I've been emphasizing a lot of balance. Um, okay. Rather than, but that was not to imply yeah. um, uh, the that the rate of change. It's actually, it's actually both. I mean, they're, you're looking, you're actually talking about different things. Uh, right. They are two different take-home messages that are both consistent with the, with the science right. and actually a good point the, of communication. The reason I ask is because when we recently developed a web rangers activity simplifying this very complex science for like six-year-olds. Wow. And we were working with the um, carbon emission expert at NASA, and he stressed uh, Woody Turner or? Uh, Peter Griffith. Oh, Peter Griffith, yeah. Um, and he was stressing that it that it's really that rate of change that everybody should be concerned about, and the balance isn't is maybe secondary. And so I just wondered. I, I know. I mean, there are like two. There are two different aspects. Right. So when we say balance, if you're talking about the. I was referring to like the carbon cycle, and that's kind of the causes and, and the rate of change. Kind of the impact. So one is looking at the cause, and one is looking at the impact. So you're you're communicating about two different two aspects things, of, yeah. of the issue. I think um, we went back and forth a lot about it. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. Oh okay. Uh, and, um, so so you have my take on it then. And I think this is, I think it's it's a matter of communication. I don't think it's a matter of science in this case. I think it's more of a matter of communication. Um, um, if you so yeah. it's, um, it's kind of a qualitative yeah. question. I also want to say that that activity is almost is, is live as of the end of this week, and it takes oh, a lot of this cool. and for a very general audience. So 
I learned a lot, so maybe you would if you did it too. <laughs> okay, let's, um, Angie. I have a question. Is it, yeah, then we probably Oh, should. and then we have three. So we have three, four people. Uh, one, two, three, four. And then we can go on after that. Okay, okay. Um, so when I talked to you a couple weeks ago, you had thrown out that number about 93% that human activities account for 93% of the causes of climate change on the earth. And that blew me away. That was the first time I had heard a number or a percentage to the amount that human activities are causing climate change. And so, like, thank you for that. That's yeah. very cool. And also, so does that mean that we can say that we are 93% of the solution? Or does that mean we can say we're 100% of the solution? Is that actually <laughs> <laughs> um, We're actually kind of in a hole because we need to reduce need to from, past, from past emissions. So actually, 93 percent well, okay. <laughs> um, I, I can be more excited. Actually, in order for us to um, to to stop to to uh, maintain atmospheric composition at its current uh, level, we would need to reduce our uh, emissions by 85 percent. Whereas the Kyoto Protocol, for example, is 5.2 percent, uh, just for the industrial. Sector. So when you hear that um, California through Assembly Bill 32 calls for a 20% reduction by 2020, you know, that's actually not even, it, as innovative as that is, that's actually not enough that we need 85% uh, reduction uh, to stay. stay. So um, we are 100% of the solution to, to answer your question. <laughs> yes? Quick question, and this might come up for visitors, but I'm curious, what is the origin of the term greenhouse gases? Oh, it's an analogy. I'm pretty sure that Arrhenius, who was uh, a scientist in the 18th century, who first wrote down and uh, scientifically described this phenomenon, um, it's an analogy to being in a greenhouse, how heat is trapped physically by the glass. Um, uh, it's an imperfect analogy because um, uh, you know, we don't have a hermetic seal uh, uh, keeping things in, but it's, a, it's an approximate analogy that you know, things are reflected back onto the earth. <coughs> yes? I was curious with your, your yellow and orange budget slide. Um, uh -huh. the relative percentage of sequestration by oceans versus forests. I thought ocean would be considerably higher than that given that 70% of the planet is covered. Is that a factor of just exposed surface area on trees and plants and whatnot as opposed to a flat surface area in the ocean? Oceans um, remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere from mainly two, through mainly two mechanisms, and one is through uh, phytoplankton and other plankton, and zooplankton, actually uh, breathing in. Um, I'm sorry, no, it would only be phytoplankton, uh, uh, taking in carbon dioxide, and then the dissolution of, of carbon in the water physically. Um, the biomass in the oceans, the photosynthetic capacity is much lower than terrestrial vegetation, and that explains um, that. Actually, um, uh, we've seen actually that the, ca that the capacity of vegetation to, net to, to take in carbon dioxide has been increasing, ironically, because carbon dioxide, in a certain sense, accident as a fertilizer, so we've seen an increased growth of trees in certain areas. And so the more trees you have, the more carbon dioxide they're taking in, and then you have more trees, and they take in more uh, self-reinforcing cycle. So that has actually been increasing. It used to be about the same magnitude as the ocean. Okay, I um, want to, we have two more. Yeah. Right? Or no, three. Uh, one more. Yeah. Um, a couple of um, New Zealand considerations. Um, so Tasman Glacier, I walked up and down a lot at uh, university in the 90s. Oh, really familiar with those moraines and I went 
think, back about four years ago with my wife. And it was just I thought you had an anti portal accident. Just, just to see the size of the, the lake that was formed. Yeah. I love how yeah. that huge lake has grown like 50% in 12 years. Um, New Zealand's a country that considered, I don't know if they followed through with the carbon tax on methane because of flatulence of cattle as a greenhouse gas. As a greenhouse gas. Is this, is methane from, from agricultural industries, is that really a, a greenhouse issue? Or we should be uh, it just yes, yeah. methane from any source because of its uh, molecular structure actually um, has. 24 times the impact of, of, of carbon dioxide of equal amounts. So methane is much more potent. And so even, even if you only have a little bit, then you only need like one, you know, one twenty-fourth to, to achieve the same um, effect as, uh, as uh, the same amount of carbon dioxide. So uh, it is, it, it's, it's kind of, um, it's in that, it's actually in that first line of that orange, you know, carbon balance thing. Uh, it's included in kind of uh, general human activities because it, it, it still isn't as much as deforestation, uh, for example. Uh, okay. I know you got to move on, but that just brought up something. Okay. Is the fact that there's more and more people, we give off methane. It, it, it's just my existence here giving greenhouse gases, and if there's more people, is that going to affect it too? Since we're at what seven billion now, going to ten? Uh, well, yes, eventually. and I I don't know uh, quantitatively the answer to that, but um, uh, theoretically, yes, yeah, that we are, uh, you know, through our respiration, through our emissions of methane, <laughs> you know, <laughs> contributing <laughs> contributors, yeah, hypothetical. But I haven't seen anything like that. Okay. Any, any, any calculations? All right, so um, <clears throat> so I will try to speak for uh, about 45 minutes maximum, and uh, on these three sections, historical impacts. So um, over the um, over the uh, 20th century. Temperature has increased around the world, uh, an average of seven tenths of a degree Celsius, so that's uh, over a degree Fahrenheit. And this shows the distribution of temperature changes across North America. This comes from research that I uh, uh, had published last year, and it's global, and I just cut out North America for you. And we see it actually that the temperature changes, and this is based on actual uh, observations of temperature. This isn't, um, this, these aren't projections. These are uh, based on actual observations at real weather stations. And uh, we see that uh, the boreal areas of the world, the polar and boreal areas of the world have been warming faster, and that uh, in northern Canada and Alaska, that you have increases in the same period of two to four degrees Celsius, uh, whereas uh, in some parts of the, um, the middle latitudes, the increases have not been as much. 95% of the national park system area is in areas of uh, temperature increases in the 20th century, and 50% of the park service area is, is in areas of statistically significant warming. So we are feeling it. And that's actually from a, a manuscript that I have uh, in the works right now. And you can see kind of the little green uh, parts of the national park system. So one of the impacts of climate change is basically an increase in uh, the energy that's in the atmosphere. And energy gets translated into convection, which translates into storms. <coughs> And so one of the major impacts of climate change has been an increase in precipitation globally in the 20th century of um, approximately 10% average over the world. But again, we see uh, spatial differences. And very notably, in 
the southwestern U U.S., we see a long-term decrease, and in West Africa, where I uh, conducted, I've conducted research for a long time, actually, uh, you see decreases of up to 30% during the time period. Here in the U.S. Southwest, you see 5, 10, uh, 15 degrees. <coughs> so these are actual historical changes. And um, I wanted to describe for you uh, three specific terms that describe specific scientific procedures when we're looking at historic impacts. And, and what is, and they're, they're also just regular English words, but uh, scientists can use these in, in a precise way when we're dealing with climate change research. And observation is recording changes over time but not necessarily analyzing them statistically. And detection is the measurement of changes over time, and you statistically test to see whether it's a departure from, from uh, natural variability. And in order to do that, statistically, you generally need at least 30 years of data. So, um, so a lot of the inventory and monitoring data that the Park Service has only goes back maybe 17, 15, well actually you know, some of it is just being installed right now, so it goes from zero to maybe 17 years. Um, a lot of the inventory and monitoring data we can't use for detection, but we can use for observation. And attribution then is determining the relative importance of different explanatory factors. So, of course, you have uh, human urbanization, invasive species, uh, climate change, uh, wildfire. You have a lot of different factors. And uh, climate change isn't causing all the, all the bad things in the world. Um, attribution is a very important scientific procedure because it guides our management response. If, uh, if, an, if a detected impact is really due to um, uh, air pollution or to another human cause, then a management response is addressing those human causes, local human causes, rather than global climate change. But when we can attribute a change to climate change, then that calls for new, novel adaptation measures, things that we haven't uh, tried before in the past. So some of the historic impacts that have been detected and attributed using field data from national parks are uh, decreased snowpack, earlier snow melt, and a reduction of the ratio of snow to rain, so more precipitation falling as rain rather than snow in the winter. And this comes from weather station data from 53 uh, national parks in the western United States. Um, plus other, other uh, meteorological stations in the western U.S. And uh, of course that includes uh, Rocky Mountain. As I mentioned uh, previously, and, and the guy from, uh, from Yosemite knows that uh, uh, published research has, has, has detected upslope shifts of small mammals and vegetation in Yosemite National Park and attributed that to climate change. Right here is the, uh, the tidal gauge that has the longest time series in the Western Hemisphere. And the National Park Service is the host of that tidal gauge. Uh, since 1855, sea level has risen uh, about that much at the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. And research has attributed that to climate change. Again, research by USGS scientists in Sequoia, uh, Yosemite, uh, Lassen Volcanic, and two other, uh, Rocky Mountain, and one other park has shown uh, that mortality rates of mid elevation conifers has doubled. Since approximately the 1960s, and so we detected that change and also attributed it to climate change. The 
Christmas bird count of the Audubon Society provides a really uh, uh, great database across the United States. And analysis of that data uh, has detected a northward shift of winter bird ranges of uh, a half a kilometer approximately a year uh, from 1975 to 2004 in areas that include 54 national parks across the U.S., not just the western U.S., and that includes um, this species, Evening Grosbeak, in, in Shenandoah National Park. Okay, so those were examples from data from National Park. I wanted to show you two, uh, a, a, a couple of more examples that don't necessarily use data from National Park, but of course are causing impacts on National Parks. And one is the increase in hurricanes due to warmer sea surface temperatures caused by climate change. And this is over the Caribbean in 2000. Uh, in 2000. And uh, warmer summer temperatures have also reduced uh, Arctic sea ice by a fifth since 1979. OK. So let me give you a couple of examples of impacts that uh, we've observed in national parks, but not necessarily attributed to climate change. Uh, and one is uh, a later ice freeze and an earlier breakup across all five uh, Great Lakes, but including Lake Michigan, where Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore is. This is consistent with climate change, but analyses have, have not yet um, been able to uh, attribute it to climate change. And uh, uh, Craig Allen from USGS and Dave Brashears from the University of Arizona and colleagues have used on the ground data and remote sensing across the southwestern US and uh, documenting, including here at Bandelier National Monument and in Shen, and detected an uh, increase in mortality of pinon pine, an extensive area. It's consistent with climate change. Uh, if you remember that one map, you saw that brown area in the southwestern U.S. It's the exact same area. Uh, decreased precipitation leading to uh, tree mortality. Um, they are looking at different factors. And it's consistent with climate change, but not yet attributed formally to climate change. OK, so those are historical impacts. And my recommendation for, for you as interpreters is that you are on most solid ground when you're talking about um, historical observed impacts. Uh, and observation, detection, and attribution is the increasing uh, are, are the increasing levels of scientific investigation that document those types of impacts. Okay, so when we uh, then talk about future vulnerabilities, we're talking about the combination of what has happened in the past with what might happen in the future. And, um, and the National Park Service, our partners, a lot of naturalists, a lot of resource management organizations are conducting vulnerability analyses to look specifically at this question. And vulnerability is just the susceptibility of a species, ecosystem, or other resource to changes in climate. It has three components. Exposure, which is climate, basically. Sensitivity, which is um, the, uh, the qualities of, uh, of a species, ecosystem, or uh, other, other resource to to withstand uh, changes in, in climate or exposure. And adaptive capacity is then is the ability of a, of a resource to actually change its behavior or where it is in, in the landscape to adapt to the, the exposure. Uh, the data I, I wanted to emphasize that uh, right now, we're actually, because of the time lag between when we emit greenhouse gases to the atmosphere to when uh, the world warms up because of that. 
and then the time lag between when we see the warming and when the species and ecosystems respond. We're actually today seeing the impacts of, of past climate change. We have, there's two time lags in there. And so when looking at vulnerability, it's important to consider, it's important for scientists to consider both historical impacts as well as future projections. A lot of the reports or things that you see just say, oh, it's going to be, you know, X degrees hotter in 2100. Um, and again, I think we're uh, on extremely solid ground where we're talking about historical observations in, in the science. Uh, scientists also consider that using historical plus uh, future projections is, is more ro a more robust way of examining vulnerability. Okay, and the results of these vulnerability analyses uh, uh, or the most robust ones are confidence levels. What we were talking about earlier, 90%, 95%. And then spatial analyses that point out where in the landscape uh, we see greater vulnerability and where in the landscape we see potential refugia or potential harbors, potential safe areas for species and ecosystems. Okay, but when we're talking about projections, we wanted to, this is the extra slide that I ended in, uh, Angie, um, because it occurred to me this morning that I uh, was going to start talking about projections in GCMs and not actually explaining in great detail. Okay, when we're looking at when we are projecting future greenhouse gas emissions, uh, we have two types of models. They're combined to give us a single result. And the first are emission scenarios, and those are stories of what the future might be, of what uh, population energy use, the intensity of energy use, the level of economic uh, disparity in the world. And so the IPCC brought together scientists in 2000 and, and developed six discrete scenarios of, of how the world uh, might um, evolve, how our human world might evolve. So they're not predictions, they're projections based on these assumptions. Uh, okay, uh, population growth might be this, and energy growth might be this, and GNP growth might be this. So uh, on the left side then, we have our um, three main the three main uh, emission scenarios. Uh, we have the red, the green, and the blue. And basically, the, the green is kind of medium uh, warming, and blue is lesser warming, and the red is greater warming. So, um, and those are the averages of general circulation models. And general circulation models are uh, numerical computer simulations that you use within a single emission scenario. So within a single emission scenario, we actually have uh, up to 23 different atmos atmospheric models that, that take all of the input on population energy and then the atmospheric, um, uh, the, atmos the atmosphere, the oceans and the land response and model what might happen to here temperature and here precipitation. And each one of those thin lines is an individual uh, general circulation model. And we have up to uh, actually 23 of them. And so here, these left three graphs are temperature, and these right three graphs are precipitation. And it's it's higher emissions, medium emissions, and lower emissions. And so you see for a single um, emission scenario, the, G the GCMs, I don't we'll start calling them GCMs now for sure, general circulation models. And the GCMs give you a range for the exact same set of assumptions for emission scenario. So that's why when you average them all together, Scientifically, you should portray them as a band. And so you see kind of in this left-hand graph, you see the dark line, of course, is the central tendency. And the, um, 
the band is the uh, range around that. <coughs> so emission scenarios and general circulation models. This applies only to uh, projections of the future. Uh, when we talk about historical observations, you can actually calculate statistically what the standard deviation, what the actual statistical variation is. When we're talking about the future, you need to quantify your assumptions. And we quantify them by looking at different ways of, of, of looking at the atmosphere. OK. So let me give you uh, uh, several examples of vulnerability uh, analyses and then key vulnerabilities in the national park system. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a fundamental vulnerability of ecosystems, and that is that climate change uh, is tending to cause vegetation to shift upslope and towards the poles where it's cold, colder or towards the equator where you have more rainfall. And uh, this is that um, research that, my research that was published uh, last year. And what this map actually shows are 15 locations around the world. And this is a result of an exhaustive scientific literature research. 15 locations around the world where we've detected shift in vegetation and attributed it to, bio, to uh, climate change. And a biome is um, a major vegetation type, such as boreal forest or deciduous forest or tropical rainforest. And so a change of a biome is a very substantial change. It's not just a change of one species. It's a change of the, the entire type of habitat. And we've seen this in, in, in boreal, temperate, and tropical ecosystems. Um, so the question is, well, what is the future vulnerability? Where are more vulnerable areas in the future? And where are potential refugees to, to that? So we've seen some of the factors looking at, at historical uh, temperature and precipitation. And then here, are, here is uh, the, a map of the projection. And this is, this is that medium, um, medium emission scenario. And actually, you can see that the, the, the projected increase in temperature is fairly uniform. It's greater, it's greater the farther north you go. But for North America here, it's a, a projection of four degrees increase uh, Celsius by the end of the century. Precipitation, these are the projected patterns of precipitation based, uh, again, on that middle emission scenario and three GCMs. That, that actually span the range of all of the 23 of those GCMs. And so um, overall, an increase uh, across North America, we see actually substantial projected decreases in uh, the Midwest, in California, and in Florida. OK, so that's the historical data as part of this vulnerability analysis then. Um, we look at what the potential response of the vegetation would be. And based on the historical data, uh, these are the, the vegetation biomes for North America. And you see 13 biomes there, ranging from tropical rainforest to desert to um, uh, temperate shrubland to uh, broad, uh, temperate broadleaf forest to mixed forest to uh, temperate conifer forest to boreal conifer forest to tundra to ice. Okay. Comparing this to remote sensing, uh, our classification was about 80% accurate, which is uh, in the range of work like this. So this <coughs> is present day. Now what happens with climate change? OK, this is the most strict um, result looking at complete agreement of all those squiggly lines in, the, in, in those graphs, looking at where all of them agree. And uh, this uh, it projects this pattern in vegetation. And then the worst case, looking where, uh, where any change in vegetation is projected is there. So Can you do that again? Yeah, I was just going to. Um, so here's <coughs> today. Here's with climate change. And that's worst case. Today, climate change, worst case. And so you see 
um, potential shifts of hundreds of kilometers uh, for the, the major vegetation, the major habitat types. So taking then all of that uh, fairly complex climate data and translating it into uh, an index, I'm sorry, uh, translating into a measure of vulnerability that, that resource managers can more easily use. Uh, we classify each of the pixels, the little squares in the landscape, uh, into five vulnerability classes. And, and um, actually these numbers are the confidence in, in our estimates of vulnerability. And those terms are the, the precise terms that the IPCC uses for those um, confidence ranges. Anyway, um, so we see, of course, red is more vulnerable, uh, green denotes potential refugia, and um, fit, uh, approximately 15% um, uh, of North America then is in areas of high to very high uh, vulnerability. And so we see we see the transition from broadleaf forest to mixed forest to temperate conifer to to, to boreal. Those are those um, latitudinal, those uh, east-west areas of vulnerability in the, the western U.S. In the eastern U.S. and um, and then other areas of vulnerability. So this is a type of analysis then that shows the uh, great vulnerability, and I'm, I'm actually continuing this work at a finer scale that uh, will be more usable to parks. This is a global analysis, and really the scale is too coarse for individual parks. Um, but it's an example of a vulnerability analysis. So a lot of other work like that is, is proceeding, and of course the US Geological Survey and a lot of other uh, Park Service partners have been monitoring glaciers, especially in Glacier National Park, North Cascades National Park Complex, Olympic National Park, Glacier Bay National Park. Those are the main parks um, uh, where published research has, has looked at uh, glacier melt. And uh, so this is a potentially uh, uh, substantial future vulnerability that long-term climate change is combining with medium-term climate cycles to, to reduce uh, glaciers in Glacier National Park. Now, the latest research, uh, the, the reason why I included here potential vulnerability, not at the very be beginning of the, this part of the presentation where we have like historic impacts, is that we have two factors at play with uh, Western United States glaciers that we have this medium-term cycle of ups and downs in temperature uh, that occurs every uh, 11 or 12 years. It's called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. It's a lot like El Nino. It's a, it's a cyclical phenomenon. And, and, right, and uh, that's kind of uh, confusing the signal from climate change. And so both of those are contributing to glacial melt in Glacier National Park. And the, uh, the scientists that are looking at this cannot yet definitively say, OK, it, it's only climate change doing this, or climate change is more important. Yet in the future, um, our analyses show that certainly climate change um, is, uh, is a major threat to, uh, to ice and glaciers in the national parks. And of course, uh, animals like the pika that inhabit uh, tundra and uh, Alpine habitats with the potential shifting of, of uh, vegetation uh, habitat for uh, wildlife like this and for plants might, might completely shift off the top of mountains. Um, and the forest dieback that we're seeing in across the western US and Canada due to uh, bark beetles is very consistent with climate change and with the increase in temperature. And uh, scientists are looking at, at the connection with climate change even more. Uh, we know, or we do know that uh, it is a potentially future uh, a vulnerability because, of course, the, uh, it's caused because of shorter winter 
which used to kill bark beetles, and now bark beetles can, over, can, can live throughout the winter farther and farther north and in greater numbers. Um, so it's a, a potentially great future of vulnerability uh, in Rocky and you know, across the western United States. Wildfire has increased in mid-elevation conifers across the U.S. since the 1970s. And this is consistent with uh, climate change and um, vulnerability analyses are indicating more increases in wildfire uh, that exceed natural variability. Of course, sequoia, giant sequoia and, and most, um, uh, most uh, temperate forests actually need fire to a certain extent. It's an ecological function. But when you exceed the, the natural range of variability, then it's a potential vulnerability for, for that uh, vegetation type and a potentially uh, a potential, potential change to another vegetation type. And uh, recently published analysis of Joshua Tree, the species in Joshua Tree, the national park, plus uh, uh, many other national parks in California, Nevada, and Arizona indicate high vulnerability uh, across three quarters of its range based again on historical climate and Joshua tree distribution and projected uh, future. And buffalo grass in Saguaro National Park has been increasing and uh, the Conditions of climate change, which include increased carbon dioxide, which fertilizes uh, vegetation, and um, increased temperature, favor buffalo grass, and its, uh, its competitor was uh, saguaro. Saguaro doesn't tolerate fire very much. This is, a, this is one particular potential vulnerability of the desert ecosystem to invasion of plant species, which could be exacerbated by climate change. Uh, Julio Betancourt and a lot of other scientists are actually looking specifically at this problem across the, the, uh, the Southwest. And uh, climate change is causing increased uh, frequency of storms and, and greater uh, uh, storm intensities. And that could lead to greater coastal erosion in Point Reyes National Seashore and in other seashores and lake shores that the National Park Service manages. The U.S. Geological Survey has actually conducted a vulnerability analysis of 22 uh, national seashores and lake shores, and, and you may be familiar with it. It's, it's posted online. It provides uh, th that's th the same type of maps uh, that I showed with the red, yellow, and green, uh, high, medium, and low vulnerability. And um, of course, one of the, I, I mentioned very early on the function of oceans as a sink of carbon dioxide. And uh, what happens chemically when carbon dioxide dissolves in water is it creates carbonic acid and it, it lowers the pH or increases the acidity of water. Um, we've detected this, and this is a potentially substantial vulnerability for all of the, the world's oceans. And uh, a coral bleaching event in 2005 uh, uh, killed off a lot of corals in the Caribbean Sea. And uh, National Park Service researchers uh, from uh, the Virgin Islands and from Florida have been working on this. Okay, so now we've seen the uh, historical impact, you see the potential vulnerabilities for the future. The National Park Service has recognized this, and, uh, and Angie may have gone through our, our, our program uh, with you a little bit, but on one slide I wanted to summarize for you our, our general response. And uh, over the course of a year and a half, working groups of Park Service employees uh, developed a strategy with uh, four different uh, components. And in September 2010, it made it, made it through the chain and, and the director signed, 
signed it, and the National Park Service officially uh, issued this strategy with, the, with the, those four uh, component sites, adaptation, mitigation, and communication. And, um, and the Park Service has been building up a team, and this is from our retreat <coughs> last year. Uh, actually, the, uh, almost everybody in that, in that photo was, was uh, new at the time, Angie. Was, uh, Angie and Lee Welling, the manager, were the only really uh, two long, uh, two established uh, climate change response program uh, personnel. Now we have five core staff and um, a dozen or two dozen other staff that are in regions, parks, and in decentralized positions so that we can diffuse the, uh, the lessons and work of climate change uh, it, it, as great as possible into the field. So science is just one part of this, um, and it's of course the part that I work on <coughs> most. We're interdisciplinary, but I, uh, uh, I'm going to focus on the science part. And with National, uh, National Park Service Climate Change Science, we aim to do two things, and one is to answer resource management questions, and so it's applied science. It's not just basic science, but uh, answer them in a way that contributes to published scientific knowledge. So it is applied and basic uh, research. So the national park units are proceeding um, through uh, the general process of resource management under climate change. And this is the process as it appears in the strategy. And I've provided some more detail as we've been working out uh, in specific places, uh, working out how to implement this on the ground and in the water. So uh, the, the resource management process under climate change starts with reducing the cost. Well, any problem, uh, attacking any problem starts with reducing the cause of the problem. And here the cause of the problem are, are greenhouse gas emissions. And so through the Climate Friendly Parks Program, of course, many uh, parks are, uh, re are uh, reducing their emissions uh, by increasing energy efficiency. <coughs> we can also naturally store carbon, as we discussed er earlier, through forest management practices that we're already doing that as a side benefit, also store carbon. Okay, so that's, and that's uh, number one, is reducing the cause. Uh, and then very early on in the process, of course, is uh, focusing on resource managers' questions. And then we spoke about detection and attribution. We spoke about vulnerability analyses. Uh, Angie, I think, has spoken about scenario planning, uh, which is, a, again, an interdisciplinary dialogue of managers and the scientists to identify the greatest uh, climate uncertainties and develop management options for, wild, for uh, widely divergent possible futures. Uh, number six, then, is pretty much the state where uh, we're at right now and where a lot of resource management organizations are at right now. Uh, a, lot of this, a lot of the work has been done up to the point of, okay, let's develop actual measures and, and try to implement them on the ground. And I'm going to talk about a couple of those. Uh, I'm just going through the general process right now. Prioritizing locations. Uh, involves taking that vulnerability uh, spatial data and saying, well, th these areas are more vulnerable or less vulnerable, and so they're a greater or lesser priority, depending on the uh, fundamental values uh, of a park. Uh, and then actually implementing the actions, um, monitoring the effects, and of course, that feedback of uh, adaptive management. And science contributes to all the entire process, each of these 10 steps. Um, uh, most importantly, it, it provides information, uh, I think, for these uh, four steps. So let me talk about, um, let me talk about uh, these four steps in the, the time that we have remaining. Um, so the number one step, as I started to talk about, okay, reduce emissions and natural, uh, naturally store carbon. You know, a published analysis of the climate-friendly parks, greenhouse gas emissions from the first 18 parks 
which account for 10% for one-tenth of the Park Service area and one-fifth of its visitors, showed that, that the emissions totaled the emissions of a, a U.S. city of 21,000 people. So our efforts to increase energy efficiency and, uh, and uh, use renewable energy actually has a substantial positive impact in, in reducing, um, uh, reducing the cause of, uh, of uh, climate change. Um, I'm principal investigate, I'm a principal investigator on a current resource, uh, research project in California. Um, and the National Park Service manages forests with the highest carbon densities in the world. So the National Park Service manages forests with the highest carbon densities in the world, in the Coast Redwood Forest and in the Giant Sequoia Forest in the Sierra Nevada. So they're, they're dense. They're not as expansive as the tropical rainforest, but they're very dense because, of course, uh, the giant sequoias are massive and the, the coast redwoods are, are the tallest trees on Earth. Um, so having spatial data on that gives us, will give us a better uh, idea of that globally important service that the Park Service provides in managing those forests. And in the Everglades, uh, some very good published re research in, in a, a very advanced scientific setup which uses carbon flux towers to look at um, the flow of carbon in the atmosphere and in, and in the water and in vegetation. It has documented important carbon stores in the mangrove forests in, uh, in, the, in southern Florida and the export of carbon through, uh, through, uh, through uh, aquatic ecosystems. Okay. So that's some of the that's some of the work on, on carbon in the, in the National Park Service. Um, you know that whole section was on detection and attribution, so we actually covered a lot of the detection and attribution occurring in the Park Service. So vulnerability analyses. <clears throat> right now, we have uh, two completed vulnerability analyses uh, in the National Park Service, and 13 others that are in progress right now, and these are. Of all the great work that the, the Park Service does, um, uh, me and the, the Climate Change Science Working Group, we sifted through the information and we looked at, okay, which, uh, vulnerability, which uh, efforts looked at all three components of vulnerability and which one uh, identif were identifying vulnerable areas and uh, potential refugia. And those were the most complete vulnerability analyses, and we have 15 of them. Two of them are finished, the one on uh, coastal vulnerability that USGS did for us, and one that was recently completed on two Hawaii national parks in coastal climate change. And you see here the range uh, of, of uh, studies ranging from looking at Shenandoah salamander to desert bighorn sheep, individual species, or um, ecosystem types like uh, uh, freshwater, I'm sorry, tidal. Uh, freshwater marshes in the Potomac and um, salt marshes in Acadia. And um, recognizing the importance of our resource management partnership with the, uh, the, the Forest Service, individual units have uh, developed from the ground up these important landscape scale science and adaptation uh, projects with their partners, and we have six of them actually, um, four of them in the Pacific West region alone. And what these involve are going actually through all 10 of those steps, from sites to adaptation, going end to end through that process and trying to use sites to answer resource managers' questions, implement it on the ground, and uh, improve the resilience of resources to climate change. And one good example of this is occurring in the southern Sierra Nevada, and I'm on the science team for this. Um, and just recently, two weeks ago, came back from Sequoia. We're in the middle of our vulnerability analyses, in the middle of our uh, scenario planning. And what we're doing is we're using historical fire and climate data and projections to um, analyze the vulnerability of giant Sequoia and other focal resources in the park. 
and then the park is going to put that information into their uh, fire management plan, the official uh, fire management plan, so that they implement future burn decisions uh, based in part on climate change information. So um, that's end-to-end -end action. And uh, that uh, pretty, uh, pretty much brings us to the conclusion of the material. And, uh, but in conclusion, I wanted to emphasize our responsibility, uh, both uh, professionally, but also personally, in uh, reducing the causes of climate change. And the very simple things, uh, such as walking more instead of driving the car, and I'm sure a lot of you do these things. The National Park Service has, has been very innovative. Uh, I just wanted to remind you that uh, you and I can make a difference and prevent the most drastic impacts of climate change uh, that we've seen previously. So you and I can make a difference. Thanks a lot.
<laughs> some, some historic sites that are, might be currently being impacted by climate. Oh, well, okay, that's easy. Okay. Say cultural. Well, Fort Point. Oh, historical cultural, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, this is an area that we're interested in. But, uh, I, would, I, would I would suspect that, uh, that increases in, in storm, any, uh, of course we know the Cape, 